So my name is Ashley Elizabeth. I'm the administrative manager here at the League. Um, welcome to Cross Pollinations, our Canadian Health Humanities virtual round series. Um, really happy to be continuing um, the series this year. Um, I think it was quite successful last year. Um, really enjoyed having everyone um, that we had come on. Um, today we have uh, Kyla. Uh, Jameson, who um, led our accessibility webinar last month, um, which is will be available on YouTube as soon as I post it. Um, and it was phenomenal. There's so much um, really important information that we're um, really looking forward to sharing. And we also have Sadiqa Damar, who um, is in the same writing group as me. We're living in the same city. Um, so I'm really happy to be sharing this space with her um, in a different context, but still in the poetry world. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give the League's land acknowledgement and uh, my own little land acknowledgement here for Kingston, and then um, I will introduce Kyla. So the League of Canadian Poets would like to acknowledge that this organization is situated upon traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat, Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. The treaty that was assigned for this particular set of lands is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applied lands east of Brown's Line to Woodbine Avenue, north towards Newmarket. The League of Canadian Poet recognizes this enduring presence of Indigenous people on this land. The League also recognizes that art, poetry, and poetic practice related to the work of our organization takes place in traditional territories of many different nations. We encourage each attendee here today to learn more about the treaties and history of Indigenous people tied to the lands where you live and work. Um, I definitely encourage you, if you feel comfortable, um, including where you're coming from, zooming in from today in the chat, um, and any uh, land acknowledgements you would like to make as well. Um, I am. I would like to acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, Katarakwe, Kingston, the Algonquin Anishinaabe and Allied Nations, the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy, which includes the nearby Mohawks and many other First Nations people who cross these lands for sustenance, trade, and survival. And so first up, we have Kyla Jameson. I'm going to remove myself and spotlight her so we can give her our attention. Um, go. Okay, Kyla Jameson is a disabled poet and anti-ableist educator who lives with a dynamic and invisible disability resulting from a brain injury. Her first book, Body Count, was a CBC Best Poetry Book of the Year in 2020 and was shortlisted for the Pat Lowther Memorial Award. Born and raised in Squamish and North Vancouver, Kyla now lives and relies on the traditional unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and, oh, <laughs> should have looked this up, Tulis, okay, Slay thank you, <laughs> nations, where she dreams of systemic change, careful futures, and disabled joy. Take it away, Kyla. <laughs> thank you, Ashley. Oh. Ashley Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I am coming from the territories of the Squamish, Mesquite, and tsleil nations um, that I live and rely on um, in so many different ways. Um, I'm going to be reading um, one poem from my first book um, and then a few newer poems. And I've just dropped a link in the chat um, to the access text. Um, so that's where you can follow along with the text of my poems, if that is beneficial for you. Um, so I'm really happy um, to be able to do this. I was actually asked to be part of the series last year and I was um, too unwell to participate. So I'm really happy to be able to be with you all today. Um, a lot of my work is related to my experience of a disabling concussion um, and other chronic illnesses. Um, so I think a lot about how one's sense of self can be altered by a brain injury and by experiencing disability. Um, I write a lot about sick time, about care, and about how to conceptualize disability beyond the medical model of disability. 
Um, I also write about the process of rebuilding a sense of self that's rooted in community and creativity and adaptive wisdom rather than privilege or ability, which is where, um, if we really look at it, a lot of sense of self can tend to come from. <laughs> Um, so, um, I'm gonna start with a poem from Body Count. Um, my first book took more of a documentary approach to describing my experience with, um, post-concussion syndrome, um, because my cognitive dysfunction was so severe that I couldn't really, um, go deeper in terms of conceptualizing or understanding, um, all of the different symptoms I was experiencing. It took me a long time to have the language for a lot of what I was dealing with. Um, so um, I was also kind of told that I could just wait and things would get better on their own. And that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, here I am six years later and have had a headache all day. Um, so this poem is about those early months. It's called September. The month I think I'll be better passes. I pick a new month, it passes, then another, everything passes me by, at least I'll get better, at least I'll get better, I'll get, I'm getting, am I getting, will I? Um, I'm working on my second book now, um, and it's asking a lot of questions about care. Um, what is care? <laughs> who receives it, who gives it, when is it reciprocated, when is it not, um, who is deemed to be deserving of care. Um, and in the context of a lot of the health issues I've dealt with, um, because the only effective treatment is um, generally private pay, there's also the question of who can afford care and what happens when you can't afford care. Um, and um, I, uh, this is a bit of a content warning, is that a lot of my work um, does touch on things like suicidality um, made um, and like the loss of life that can happen when people fall through care gaps. Um, and so that is mentioned, um, I mean, that's mentioned in the next couple, the next two poems, um, because um, I think what people sometimes maybe don't realize about concussions is when you have as severe of symptoms as I did, the best case scenario is that you lose your quality of life, but the worst case scenario is that you lose your life, your actual entire life. Um, and I don't personally feel <laughs> that the way that concussions are addressed by our medical system um, reflects that reality at this moment in time. Um, so right now we're seeing the expansion of MAID. We've already seen someone with PCS choose MAID here in BC. Um, and I, it horrifies me to think of what her doctor might have told her about what her prognosis was or what treatment options she had because there isn't really any treatment option within the medical system. Um, all of this to say that the next poems I'm going to be reading, um, they're kind of situated within this context of failures of care. And when I say failures of care, I don't just mean, oh, the medical system messed up. You suck. <laughs> I mean, we don't live in a careful society. And even though I'm focused on disabled lives, I think that the fact that we don't live in a careful society is a problem for everyone. Um, so that's what a lot of my second book is about. Um, the first poem I'm going to read from my new work is about what I call chronic illness grief, which is, it's not just the grief when you, of losing people who you relate to and see yourself reflected in, but it's also often the grief we go through when we lose parts of our lives and parts of ourselves through illness and not just because of the actual symptoms themselves, but because of the disabling impacts of lack of accessibility and support um, and ableism and isolation and systemic injustice. So this past summer, I actually was finally getting the care I needed and I was doing pretty well and I was able to see people that I love, um, see friends and be in the world and, and understand myself through the privilege of being out in the world. Um, and I wrote this poem 
that has the longest preamble I've ever delivered in my life, clearly. Um, but I figured, you know, if there was a space for it, this might be it. Um, this poem is called Grief Study. I have a lot of opinions. Okay. Um, Megan, on the way to your house, I was talking to Adele and Libby in my head, except it was like a documentary and they were being interviewed about how my concussion changed me. I told you how the doctors never ask, what could you do before? Or what are your days like now? The questionnaires they give are so subjective. They ask if I don't feel right, but I'm used to being sick. I'm so used to it that when I have any energy at all, I get culture shock. I'm a stranger to normative time, standing dazed on a concrete island in a stream of traffic, a danger to myself. The other day, I just wrote, I'm so used to conserving energy, I have no idea how to spend it, and cried. In another questionnaire designed specifically for TBI, they asked if I felt valuable, as though nobody could have a brain injury and feel worthy, but still be suffering. You gave me ice cream and told me you saw everything change overnight for me. How my body folded in on itself, my steps slowed, my words slowed, my world slowed, my voice quieter than before. Megan, sometimes I can't believe who I used to be or that she existed. You describe her biking past you in your old neighborhood on her way to the climbing gym, and I feel like I'm remembering a stranger or another friend who died. She was so alive. It's like meeting someone else who knew the person I'm grieving at their funeral. Megan, I finally figured out how to turn the voice in my maps back on, but I don't ask it for directions. It's summer. The sun is out. I feel like I could lose myself driving south. Um, I promise the next poems are shorter. I think there's, there's two or three, I might just read two more, um, because of time, but, um, because I knew that this was like a poetry meets medicine type space, I figured that I should definitely read my poem about leaving a bad review for a pain clinic. Um, it just feels very, <laughs> I sort of feel like I'm trolling anyone here who is like really passionate about the status quo in medicine, but I feel like that may be not that might not be actually this group. Um, because I feel like status quo people don't generally love um, poetry. Um, <laughs> so um, this poem is called, um, the title is actually something that I stole from a textbook title. Um, it's called Medical Terminology for Health Professionals. Idiopathic means the cause is unknown, not that there isn't one. I freeze when the ECG, ECG nurse exposes my breasts without warning. The chronic pain clinic writes back to my one-star Google review. The floor in our apartment is so clean, I can eat my dignity off it. Chess is a great game, but have you ever tried enduring medical gaslighting? The neuro-ophthalmologist concedes my right eye is always wandering, but insists it doesn't matter. The sky is my favorite poem. I have the astronaut's illness, but I've never been to space. Um, I'm just gonna read one more. Is that okay for time? You could probably do two more. Or two more. Do you have two left? Well, that I do have two left. Let's see how we. <laughs> Let's do two. Yeah. Let's see how fast I can read. Um. Yeah, okay, so the next poem, um, mm, yeah, um, it's kind of about the pandemic. It's sort of about how so many things that we told could not change could actually change. Um, and I'm personally offended anytime people feel like um, this is the way things have to be nowadays because I'm like, do you remember nothing? everything about how we did, everything changed. Um, so it's partly about that, but this poem is also partly in memory of um, Alyssa Barclay. Um, she's someone who um, ended her own life because um, she didn't get the care she needed um, when dealing with PCS, and she was actually institutionalized for mental illness when she really needed concussion care. Um, so that's sort of mentioned at the end, um, and um, 
I hope nobody takes this call personally because it's partly about how I, I don't like the medical system. <laughs> um, it's called Self-Portrait as Cassandra Reading the News, March 2020. Vogue posts an article about a modest wedding at home, talks to grocery store workers, disorients me with their newfound interest in the working class. My YouTube yoga teacher appears unexpectedly in an email from the New Yorker. For the first time since wartime, big media caters to those who are housebound without income, and recipes celebrating canned goods are trending. I go to sleep one night in March and wake up to find that everyone is doing the dance I've been teaching to the shadows in my room. Each day the city gets dressed in a quiet, I thought I'd have to move away to hear. Poetry readings, I couldn't endure IRL, go virtual, displacing event inaccessibility details. Deadlines are pushed back, payments deferred, fees waived, the protest has moved online, and organizers draft a press release recanting their stance that the streets are the only valid site of resistance. My person brings his work computer home, flattening the curve of my years-long isolation. The future begins to look like a place where maybe I can get a job without a commute because buses still wreck my brain and I couldn't afford to keep my car. Meanwhile, millions of people lose their jobs, borders close, basketball hoops are taken down, backboards transfigured into blank stairs, spring blooms against a gray sky. I watch a pale worm writhe in dirty water at the ocean's edge. You know that theory about how cockroaches will survive the apocalypse? Tonight, 7 p.m. sounds like New Year's Eve. And I want to celebrate the people, but resent the systems that kill bodies like mine with neglect. This sentiment displeases the algorithm. It steeps in my body, bitter tea inside an insect. Um, okay, I'm going to read one more really short poem. Um, it's sort of a palate cleanser, so I feel like it's a good place to end. Um, and it's really just about um, the possibility of gentleness. It's called I Need a Poem. Can we talk about the moon tonight? Low and full in the baby blue sky. A friend at my door, the sound of her laugh and well-loved heart. I want to be held up like that. I need a poem about happiness that I haven't written yet. An ode to the ducks in my neighbor's pool. Another for the pink magnolias of spring. Some trees make it look so easy. Yes, I can hold all this beauty up. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. Oh. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for listening. And thank you for um, being receptive to my, my multitude of opinions. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh gosh, that line, some trees make it look so easy. Yes, I can hold all this beauty up. Oh, it's going to sing with me all night. I love that. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Some praise in the chat as well. I'll, uh, there, I'll set us back here. So we're just going to take a, a, a five minute little break. Can you turn your camera off? You can get some water, um, go to the washroom, whatever you, whatever you feel like you need. And we'll be back in five minutes with Sadika.
as we're all filtering back here. Give it a, about another 30 seconds. It's nice to get a break from screens, especially after listening to, to such wonderful poetry. Give me um, a second. What was it? Uh, Emily Riddle last night said something, or was it Selena Bone in a uh, an event we had she said my brain's chewing on it and I and I that's really stuck with me I feel like my brain's chewing on it um your words Kyla <laughs> in the best possible way <laughs> yeah and thank you for the break also I love a break um but I wouldn't be surprised if Selena said that because she's so brilliant <laughs> she was, like it. it was yeah. it was amazing I'm I'm going to be posting it so um Hopefully, if you if no one had a chance to see it, it was a panel on Indigenous languages in Canada, and it was it was quite wonderful. Um, and again, good. that chewing image. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. I'm going to spotlight you, Stiko, and introduce you. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so our next reader is um, Sadika de Meyer. She's born in the Netherlands and moved to Canada as a child. Her writing has won the CBC Poetry Prize and ARC's Poem of the Year competition. Her first book of poems, Leaving Howe Island, was a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Literature and the Pat Lowther Memorial Award. Her second poetry collection, The Outer Words, was released in 2020 and was a finalist for the Raymond Schuster Award. Her book of essays, Alphabet, Alphabet, a memoir, a me memoir of first language, was published the same year and went on to win a Governor General's Literary Award. Themes in her writing include landscape, migration, motherhood, racism, language, and spirituality. Before becoming a writer, Meyer studied medicine, and she co-taught the medicine and literature elective course at Queen's Medical School for eight years. She is currently working on new collections of poetry and essays. Um, very happy to have Sadika here and to hear some of her uh, wonderful words. Take it away. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Ashley. And um... Thank you, Kyla, for that really beautiful reading. I found it, I found it very moving, and I, um, I can all too well relate to some of what you said about your experiences with the medical system. Um, yeah, so I'm in a, I think, fairly unusual position at this moment. If this might be my ideal convergence of themes <laughs> today, because I did study medicine. Um, then I decided to be a writer. Um, and so I've been writing poetry since that time. Um, and I, um, I, I also became um, a patient. It, coincidentally, I also with a, a severe concussion about eight years ago, and that became a theme of um, my second book of poetry, um, which is the one I'll be, I'll be reading from today. So, I'm having a lot of thoughts about the intersections between what's already been said and, and read today, and I hope I can offer some, some addition to that that resonates as well. Um, yeah, so, so the first poem I'm going to read looks back to that, um, that time of, of um, being in medical school. It's called House of God. That was my cramped apartment when I studied medicine, and the alarm each morning roused a dread in me I could not shake or name. I'd rise. I'd muster courage from a base fort that I loved because its edge seemed made of light, even on overcast days, vaporous as chalk dust, snow blowing from a ridge of snow. Like the light under Diego's chair in Sunday morning number two. There was a spare hour. I shadowed a Reiki healer at his clinic. He asked me to hover my hand above the patient who nodded from the table. My palm prickled as over club soda, then warmed, then followed the voltaic streams until at her liver, the signal got lost. Cirrhosis, nodded the instructor, overturning what I thought a body was. The light under the figure in the chair, I should have said, or the child on the left, because Jack Chambers didn't name his youngest son, 
in that lucent aquatic work. The same year, he painted Victoria Hospital, a building like a void under the stark, immeasurable sky. Bleak colors of an urban winter, he began and would end in that place. In the foreground, a cluster of bare trees, I still swear, are hiding a deer, a coyote, a life. Then I forgot the material cult, internal medicine, creatinine, hematocrit, Clostridium difficile. One man on the ward was near his end. He had the sheer cheeks and sparse words of my late grandfather, who wore pale suits, smoked a seafarer's pipe, seemed to sit for decades, tabernacled in one chair. And then we were pallbearers. This patient thanked me every day for nothing really, for practicing my auscultation on the cavern of his ribs. I was on call the night his breath began to sound submerged. I phoned the family, then asked the nurse what I should do. Take his vitals, she said. So I placed two fingers on his inner wrist and felt his pulse emit a slipshod effort and then stop. And in the room, it was as if a wave receded to the ocean over pebbles, over stones that clattered with their consonants. And then I wept, although I knew I was supposed to listen for the silence in his chest and check his pupils with a light and make a closing entry in the chart. The attending was kind. He did what I should have done. Then he spoke to me at the nursing desk, this slender man who may have seen a hundred people die. All losses are won, he said, without a reprimand, and a muscle twitched behind his glasses. Should I tell you the dreams I had in that apartment? I dreamt a ghost was sitting round the corner from the bed. I heard it breathe. I heard the rustling of the newspaper it read, and when I forced myself to turn and look, the box of human bones I had for study was suspended in the air. It became who I was for that month, as we stood at the bedsides with clipboards and styrofoam cups, their white rims also fogging and diffusing below the tired murmur of our words. One resident knew all the opiates cold, generic and brand name and doses. Another loved to try out new procedures. A third had been disciplined, something to do with potassium. And I was the one who'd mistaken the figure for the familiar and cried, Diego, Diego, Diego. So that poem comes from um, this book, The Outer Wars, which um, thematically focuses on, um, so I, I had a severe concussion in 2014, and then I had a couple of others um, in, in the years that followed. And what really, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I can relate to um, a lot of what Kyla mentioned, and um, it's a condition that unfortunately does often persist, um, but I have, um, I have also been um, really grateful for, for the recovery and the strides I've made since that time. What really characterized the experience for me then was that my daughter was quite young, she was five. And so it really became a time of feeling um, like I was failing her or failing, failing as, a, as a mother in that role. And that is what the, um, the book, The Outer Words really focuses on. So I'm going to read a few poems from that that relate more to that theme and, and idea. Um, and they are a bit shorter. So this one is um, it's called How to Decline a Persistent Invitation. Yes, I'd love to, soon. A question mark, a dial tone. Her eyes are wide open, the midwife said. That dark blue ink I drowned in. 
Hang on, it won't be long. Rustles in the wall, lost stitch. The eyes, witch hazel, trusting. They used to drift, agape at sunlight in the canopy. Maybe later, love. Night winds, felled tree. Once, I saw them studiously replicate my blinking. Now, they grow a bird's transparent lids. I can't say when. Scrutiny, flowering borage, where there's smoke. They know the weather of my face, the hole in my nightgown, the pill that's rolled under the bed. This one is called How to Take Meals in Semi-Darkness. Give thanks for this clock that still quarters the day, mutes the stupid jukebox in your skull a while. Utensils have no bearing. Here is a silent offering. Here is a shadowed field on a tray, a leaf, a root, a hen, forms from the void, dim and earthly. Dear Sputnik, trust the cook. This poem um, is called The Imaging Department. Why was the clock in a cage? There should have been whistles and sweat. A floor the color of North Atlantic storms, lines of the subway map. But it wasn't a gym. The air had wavelengths, a synthetic lemon smell. We were on the same side, everyone for themselves. Were we dangerous? Would we rage at it? We held the coffee cups with trapdoor lids. Someone's sneaker blankly tapped the air. Half of the colon and most of a lung is what one woman's husband had removed. Their son said, you're half empty space. This was now, they eyed their flat bones. The father could have risen like a thick balloon, quietly thudding the ceiling, smiling shy licorice teeth. A woman in pastels came in. I'm gonna butcher this name, she said, so I stood. She led me to the table where they'd view that clockwork part of me. Lie still, real still. They started the cold IV. I'd read of a man who, during his lethal injection, jerked up three times to say, it don't work. And wanting not to think of him, I studied the ceiling's print of hands, naive and bright. So someone had been there, attempting a signal, in this room of leaden aprons and electric noise, radio recording a larger city's traffic. Dear mother, I wished you were my country again, when my ears didn't ring, when my eyelids were still knitted shut. And then I heard them say, that's it. When I turned, I saw it pulse in dark and grainy currents on a screen. Nothing like a Valentine or Dove uncatalogued marine perhaps, and blunderous and fugitive. And I am going to close my reading with the last poem in the book, which is called The Mother Shirt. Owes a little bit to Sylvia Plath, as, as does um, much of the book actually. Myselves hang like shirts that were skins. Now I am raw and peaceful. Life washes over me elementally, wave after wave. Idle sleeves. The writing shirt has a crumpled note in its pocket, but the ink has bled, illegible blue. The nostalgic shirt is embroidered becoming. The scared one still quakes, damp under the arms. The mother shirt is magnificent, stained with blackberries and tempera paint. Oh, but it moves, 
there is someone in it, small limbs straining in the membrane trap. I pull it over her head and we laugh, falling on the bed together. Sweet eruption that goes on a little too long, like the signal after the slow shuttered train has gone. Thank you very much.